Grand Coulee Dam, key feature of the Columbia Basin Project. Here, the Columbia River has been harnessed to irrigate over one half million acres with the potential to double that. Produce enough power for over 2.3 million households. Provide flood control operations to virtually eliminate the devastating floods downstream. Storage capacity to help make the other 10 downstream dams feasible, including power production. And barge traffic on the Columbia River between Portland and inland points all the way to Lewiston, Idaho. And recreation at two dozen designated project recreation areas, which attract almost 2.3 million visits each year. The building of Grand Coulee Dam has been described as one of the most significant events in the history of the Pacific Northwest. It has put the Columbia River to work. The United States Department of the Interior's Bureau of Reclamation presents the Columbia Basin Project, where water is life. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, three railroads were completed across the Columbia Basin, prompting a burst of settlement and agricultural development. Many towns founded on agricultural economies appeared along the railroads. Dry land farming was prosperous when there was enough rain and risky when it dropped to the six to 10 inch average of the area. Lack of water often resulted in widespread crop failure. Drought forced some settlers to abandon their farms others to attempt to develop water supplies for irrigation. But irrigation plans pursued by private groups and organizations during early settlement of the basin often proved too costly or too technically difficult. In response to these problems, the Washington State Legislature in 1919 funded a study of two proposed large-scale irrigation plans for the basin. During the next several years, many engineering and economic studies were made of the two proposals. The state legislature, individuals and private organizations, and the U.S. Congress discussed and argued over the plans. Finally, a proposal to dam the Columbia River at this site and pump water over 200 feet up to the Grand Coulee was deemed most economical and feasible. But by this time, 1932, the nation was suffering an economic depression. A year later, President Franklin D. Roosevelt included the Columbia Basin Project in his Public Works Administration program. Its construction, including Grand Coulee Dam, was assigned to the Bureau of Reclamation. On July 16, 1933, ground was broken for the project. In 1934, the first construction contracts were awarded. It took eight years to build, and in 1942, the dam was completed. But because of World War II, construction of the irrigation system was postponed until after the war. Emphasis was placed on installing the generators as quickly as possible, so Grand Coulee Dam's power production could be an essential ingredient in the production of airplanes and ships for the Allied effort. After the war, construction started on the pumping plant and the irrigation system. Here in 1952, the first water is being pumped from the dam to fill for the first time the 27 mile long Banks Lake formed by damming both ends of the upper Grand Coulee. Water for irrigation block one was initially pumped directly from the Columbia River near Pasco in 1948. In November 1948, the first public drawing for federally owned project land was held. Veterans received preference. To ensure orderly development, construction has been done in stages. Over a half million acres have been brought under irrigation by the project since that initial water delivery nearly 40 years ago. Beginning in the mid-1960s, construction of a third power plant at Grand Coulee Dam was made possible by a treaty with Canada for joint use of Columbia River water. Today, the Columbia Basin Project extends from the north end of 150-mile-long Lake Roosevelt, the reservoir behind Grand Coulee Dam, to Pasco, literally from the Canadian border to Oregon. 
Water drawn from Lake Roosevelt by 12 of the world's largest pumps currently irrigates about 550,000 acres of cropland in the basin. The water is pumped up over 200 feet to Banks Lake to begin its long journey south. This multipurpose reservoir not only provides irrigation storage, but is an increasingly popular recreation area and can be used to generate up to 300 megawatts of power for peak demand period. From Banks Lake, it flows through canals, twin siphons and tunnels, and on to the project's irrigated area that begins almost 50 miles south of Grand Coulee Dam. To this point, facilities are in place to serve the entire authorized project of 1.1 million acres. From here, it takes about 2,300 miles of canals and numerous other facilities to distribute the water to the nearly 2,000 farms now served by the project. The project was designed to reuse about half of the water it initially pumps from the river. Return irrigation flows from the northern part are collected here in the Potholes Reservoir near Moses Lake and are redistributed to farms in the southern portion of the project. Some water is reused by pumping from drains and wasteways, returning it to the distribution system. The annual diversion from the Columbia River to the project is about two million acre feet, less than 3% of the average flow of the river as it passes Grand Coulee Dam but reuse of a significant portion of it allows more than three million acre feet to be delivered to project farms. An acre foot is enough water to cover one acre of land to a depth of one foot. With adequate water, the ingredients are all here to create one of the world's most productive agricultural areas. Potatoes, alfalfa hay, wheat, vegetables, and various seeds are principal among the 60 different crops grown on the project. In 1984, the total value of crops produced here was over $340 million. Since 1948, the cumulative value of all crops at the farm level exceeds $4.2 billion. Another major source of income is generated from livestock, which are produced in local feedlots and on project farms. While the basin is doing very well with its wide diversity of crops, both public and private research continues for new varieties, which will improve current production or provide crops to meet special market needs, which the project may be uniquely equipped to fill. One example of privately financed research is this facility at Warden, which is dedicated to developing more disease-resistant varieties of alfalfa, 